Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 57, which reads as follows. Te sang sampanna silanang appamada viharinang sammadanya vimuttanang maro magang navindati which means for those te sang sampanna silanang for those who are endowed with morality appamada viharinang dwelling in vigilance or without negligence Samadanya vimuttanang, who are uh, liberated through wisdom, through right, right wisdom, or rightly through wisdom. Maro magang navindati. Mara is unable to find their path. And uh, this teaching was given in regards to a story that is a little bit um, hard to to explain, or a little bit um, controversial, and uh, I'll explain it, uh, it'll become clear as I tell the story. There was a uh, monk, Godika, he was dwelling in Black Rock, near Rajagaha. Um, when the Buddha was dwelling in Rajagaha, Godika was dwelling in, at Black Rock, and he was... Um, practicing what appears to be samatha meditation so he was he was attaining what we call jeto vimutti liberation of mind which comes through the attainment of the jhanas the the samatha jhana so he had this profound peace and tranquility in his mind and he was able to enter them uh, quite quite easily but then he became sick and he had this the sickness uh, prevented him or it didn't prevent him but it, it was such that Every time he attained to this liberation or to, to the, the uh, worldly um, meditative attainment, he would slip away from it. So he was unable to sustain it. And this happened once, it happened twice, it happened three times, it happened six times. And so the seventh time that it happened, he, he made a res resolution. He said, look, I'm, I'm dying here. Uh, and if I die without... It's clear I'm going back and forth in between the jhana and, and an ordinary mind state. And if I die in an ordinary mind state, it's not sure where I'm going to go. I might wind up in hell, I might wind up as an animal. But uh, if I die in a meditative state, then for sure at least I will go to the uh, higher god realms as a, as a Brahma. Um, I'll, I'll explain about that after. Um, and so he made a de he made a decision. He took his his uh, razor that he uses to c he would use to cut his hair, and he went into his kuti, his hut, and he lay down and he decided that he was going to kill himself. He was going to cut his wind windpipe with this uh, razor. And Mara, the evil one who is like the Buddhist Satan, he came along and. Uh, saw that this was happening and due to his own understanding seems to be misunderstanding of the, the of of the way things work he thought that uh, if he, he agreed with this monk he said well if this monk kills if this monk kills himself he'll go to the high brahma realms where he'll be free from my domain and i don't want that so i'll go and i'll convince the buddha to tell his student not to kill himself, because surely the Buddha doesn't want his students to kill himself, kill themselves. And so Mara went to the Buddha. Mara is like this evil spirit, and uh, he said to the Buddha, oh, "That your your student, even though he's practicing to overcome death, and he's uh, he's entered into this this state of." trying to overcome death or of overcoming death or whatever, still he's afraid of death or he's still contemplating death or he's going to kill himself. And um, the Buddha brushes him off and says that he is, uh, the, the, this monk is someone who is not afraid of death, who is someone who has overcome death, who is set in morality and so on and so on and um, brushes off Mara and, and says, uh, leave me be, and goes to Black Rock, to where this monk is staying, takes the monks there, 
and goes and sees uh, Godika, and sees that Godika actually has it has taken his life, and uh, Mara 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 is, Mara is there as well, and Mara comes and sees that Godika has died, and he vanishes, and uh, starts racing around the universe trying to find where Godika has been reborn and uh, he, he appears as this kind of a black cloud and this is something you see it reoccurs in the Buddha's teaching where Mara wherever he, whenever he's looking for someone he where they've been reborn he's like this black cloud going through the the, the racing through the skies trying to find this uh, this being where they've been reborn where they've they've continued and the Buddha says, you see that black cloud up there? That's Mara, and he's trying to find where this monk has been reborn, and he, will, he won't ever find where that, this monk is, where Godika has been reborn, because Godika has uh, become an arahant, he's become free from suffering. Mara comes back and asks him basically that, where has he gone? And the Buddha said, you'll never find such a person. Uh, you'll never find Godika. And then uh, he, he gave this... Uh, verse teaching. And he said, even uh, even a thousand of you, a thousand maras, or a thousand angels, or a thousand spirits couldn't find such a being. Uh, and then he gave the verse: those who, for those who are endowed with morality and and virtuous conduct, who are who dwell in vigilance and are liberated through right wisdom. Mara cannot find their path. And so this is a, it's a controversial teaching because it can be taken in, very, in several different ways. Um, for some people this seems to be a allowance for suicide or a nullification of any ethical um, quality to the act of killing yourself. The commentary takes it in, in probably the most or the, the least dangerous way, it gives the least dangerous interpretation to it by saying that uh, Godika and another monk like him who did a similar thing in his record in Spitaka, um, they weren't enlightened, and then when they cut their, when he cut his windpipe, thinking that he was somehow going to go to the Brahma realms, he realized what an idiot he had been, and he became afraid of death and uh, practice then insight meditation. And uh, be the point being that the moment of death is actually a really good moment to practice uh, insight meditation. It's a time when you have to let go of everything, where you're confronted with your whole life, you're confronted with all your good and bad deeds, and you're forced to confront a lot. Now, since he had been practicing meditation up until that point, even though it seemed he, all he had attained was samatha insight, it was a, a base for quite clear insight to arise as a result of his, uh, to arise as a result of the imp impending death. So that's um, there, that that answers a lot of the questions as to you know how can you condone suicide? How can suicide be a, a good thing? How can someone uh, do it innocently? But there's still the question of whether um, whether suicide itself is a bad deed. And, uh, well, of course, in Buddhism we don't consider deeds to be good or bad, right? So actually the, the act of killing ourselves isn't the problem. And I think this kind of solves some of the dilemmas about this verse, or about this story. Uh, in that uh, an ordinary person, when they want to kill themselves, is doing it out of uh, generally anger a desire to end whatever, or to be free from whatever um, suffering they're going to have, the suffering they have uh, out of depression or, or anger and, or sadness or whatever, people decide to kill themselves. And that's a really dangerous thing to do because that act is done out of negative emotions. Um, and as a result, that sort of person is going to go to a bad place or is likely to go to a bad place. But, that having been said, they still have the moment, uh, from the time of the doing that, the moment of doing that act, of, of cutting their throat, 
until the moment that they die. And that in, in the case of cutting your throat or slitting your wrist, that's still some time. If during that time uh, they're able to come to grips with, with their experience, it, it's possible that a person who kills themselves could go to a good place because they're forced to deal with those things. That, that doesn't take away the negative impact of killing yourself. It can be a bad deed. It's just that um, it, it seems likely that it would be a bad deed in most cases. Even in the case of Godika, there's still a good argument for it, being, for it being a bad karma. It's just that in the, in the um, uh, interim period between the, the killing himself and the actual dying, uh, he was able to, to gain insight. Um, that being said, it seems like in certain cases there might even be an, a, an argument for an arahant to, to be able to kill themselves. Like um, Bhikkhu Bodhi, I think he interprets this, or the Sanyutta Nikaya version, um, or maybe it's the story about Channa, there's another, the other monk who kills himself, as, um, and, and it seems reasonable to interpret it as actually an arahant, someone who's enlightened, who has no defilements. There's nothing wrong with them killing themselves. In that case, the, the point being, the only reason they would kill themselves is because they're dying anyway. Um, and it's like a cure for the, the sickness, or it's a not wanting to be a, a, a burden on other people. Now, to me, that's kind of controversial. I'm not going to go that far. Um, but I might suggest that it's possible, possible in certain situations where a person is... Um, is free from any attachment to other people. I guess that the point is, uh, if it's just the effect on yourself, it's not murder. It doesn't seem to be on the scale of murder. Killing yourself seems to be a voluntary choice that people make. If it's not affecting others, if you're not leaving dependents behind or people who love you, like if you're a monk living off from the forest alone and it doesn't matter to anyone, you're not hurting others by killing yourself. Uh, it seems that um, Buddhism doesn't have any anything specifically ethical to say about it. Now, monks aren't allowed to kill themselves. It's actually uh, it's explicitly against the rules. But uh, I think the safest thing we can say is that in certain cases, um, killing, yourself, ki killing oneself gives one the opportunity to... Uh, no, let's not even say that. But in certain cases, people have c committed the act of wanting to kill themselves and then... Um, been able to, in spite of that, come to become enlightened. And it seems uh, actually to have indirectly or in a roundabout way somehow helped them because it brought them closer to death and helped them understand death. It's by no means a encouragement toward, to, to, for suicide or even a, uh, um, an allowance for the... for. Uh, condoning of suicide in, in any way, as suicide is considered to be, mm, well, it's, un it's not allowed by monks, and it's certainly considered in Buddhism to be a negative thing. In general, it, as I said, it's something that is based on anger and based on, on uh, negative emotions. And I would say there's, there's argument to be made for, even in the case of Godika, or these monks who are practicing hard, that it was a bad choice to make. Um, just happened that by fluke, they were, as a result, able to contemplate death and, and die. It's, it's like a, a gamble, because you know that death is a time when you can um, study yourself. It's a time when you'll be, you'll be able to, um, you'll be able to uh, learn more about your emotions and uh, come to terms with them. So I guess the argument that you'd make against that is that Godika was dying anyway, and if he had waited until he was really going to die naturally, it would have actually been a much better situation and for sure he would have still been able to deal with uh, the emotion. So he didn't gain anything by killing himself, but it just hastened his uh, eventual uh, enlightenment, which, which came not as a result of killing himself, but as a result of dying, which was going to come anyway. Okay, so that's how I would resolve, in my mind, the ethical ambiguity there. But more importantly, let's not concern ourselves about the question of suicide too much. It's certainly something um, that has to be taken seriously, and you really, ha you really have to. No, one, one last thing I wanted to say is about the gamble, right? Because um, the the negative aspects of wanting to kill yourself, the anger, the um, self hatred, or, or the, whatever the depression or the negative emotions are, 
is uh, not going to set, set a good stage for your last moments. And so to take this as, as anything like a encouragement for suicide is really to take it the wrong way. Death is a gamble, and that's what Godika did realize. Uh, he was just trying to stack his stack the odds in his favor. He didn't actually succeed, right? He wanted to go to, to Brahma realms. He actually did something quite different, and that became enlightened, and therefore was not reborn. Um, but for most of us, death is a gamble, and so if you think that somehow hastening your death is going to put you closer to uh, enlightenment, it just puts you closer to that gamble, and you're stacking the odds against yourself, actually, if you're committing deeds like killing yourself based on uh, anger, based on depression, based on negative emotions. So certainly, bad idea, and most likely to lead you to a bad destination. It's actually just an exception here, I would say. Uh, it's a curious exception that we have that these monks were in such a state that um, it, uh, well, in such a state that they were, their death was a cause for them to become enlightened. It didn't, it basically didn't matter or didn't matter enough that they had killed themselves. That's how I would interpret it. But the point here is actually in the verse, which isn't dependent at all on the story. It was a cause for the Buddha to say this to Mara, or to say this to the monks, uh, to teach this to the monks, but the actual emphasis is on the qualities that um, allow one to become free from uh, Mara's uh, search. So take this how you want. Mara, in Buddhism, there are five Maras. There's uh, there's Kandamara, which are the five aggregates. Our aggregates, um, aggregates are considered a kind of evil because they cause us lots of suffering. Our body, our feelings, our memories, our thoughts, our consciousness are things that are, cause us a lot of suffering. You know, like when a person's sick, that's Kandamara because their, um, their bodies cause them suffering. So it's in, kind of an evil in that sense. There's uh, Kilesa Mara, which are the uh, evil deeds that, or the evil, the defilements that we have inside. So anger, greed, delusion, conceit, arrogance, um, worry, depression, etc., etc. All of the negative emotions and bad stuff inside. These are called kilesa mara. They're evil, bad. Um, so evil is just a word. The, the the word we use to describe these things. The third mara is abhisankara mara. These are the uh, bad deeds that we perform as a result of our defilement, so killing, stealing, lying, cheating, all the bad stuff that we do, these are evil. It's evil to kill, it's evil to steal, etc., etc. The fourth kind of Mara is Machumara, death. Death is considered an evil. It's the kind of thing that, it's this big gamble that you take. You don't know where you're going after you die, totally based on the mind state at the moment of death and all that you've cultivated up to that point. And number five is called Deva Putamara, where we, th this angel of evil, it's an evil angel who is said to torment, have tormented the Buddha and torments all of us. So he's this guy who whispers in your ear and tells you to do bad things and tells you to kill yourself, for example. Or uh, he was the guy who would go around whispering to the monks to tell them to do this or that, and uh, who tried to try to dissuade people from practicing or encourage people to practice in the wrong way, this kind of thing, kind of like Satan in Christianity. So um, there's this idea that there is this angel who, who does these sorts of things, but uh, you can also just think of it metaphorically, dealing with our struggle to become enlightened. Mara is uh, chasing us around and trying to find our path trying to keep us on the wrong path and trying to keep us under his control. Uh, every time we get angry, this is a Mara. Every time we have greed, this is a Mara. This is our path, and this is the path of Mara. All of, the, all of these things keep us going round and round, keep us tied to the wheel of samsara, keep us being reborn, keep us suffering, uh, keep us hurting others. All of these things are the realm of Mara. There are seven paths that we have to choose from. There's the path to hell, and that is the anger. Anger leads us to hell. This is a path that Mara can clearly see and encourages us on. There's the path of greed. This is or the path to uh, become a ghost. This is the path of greed. And so all of our greed and attachments, all of our desires and likes and so on, this is cultivating the addiction that eventually turns you into a ghost. This is a path of Mara, a path that Mara knows. 
there's the uh, path to become an animal, this is the path of delusion. A person who is full of delusion, all of our delusions, these are leading us to become animals. All of the uh, intoxicants and the drugs and alcohol that we take and all of our uh, arrogance and all of our conceit and all of our bigotry and all of our prejudice, this is all leading us to be born as animals. This is the path that Mara knows very well. There's the path to become a human, even this path Mara knows very well. This is the path to keeping the five precepts. So people, sometimes the Buddha, Mara, is, Mara is this guy who encourages you, it's okay, you don't have to practice, just keep the five precepts. I was talking about that earlier. Don't worry about, don't, don't practice meditation, it's enough. Practice, keep the five precepts, you'll be born as a human being. So Buddhists often get uh, um, coerced into, get tricked into this one thinking that it's enough to just keep the five precepts. At least I'm keeping the five precepts and I'm a good person, I'll be born as a human being. Still the path of Mara, still you'll be born again and again and again, and it's not a stable path because eventually you forget the Buddha's teaching and you can veer away into one of the three lower paths. Five is the path to become an angel, and this is the path of good deeds. So again, we're often coerced and are convinced by Mara, tricked by Mara into just performing good deeds, being good people, being charitable, being nice to others. We can get quite caught up in the excitement of that, the goodness of that. It's a wonderful thing. And as a result, we're born as angels. And that can be a long, long-lasting thing. But it's still the path of Mara. It's a path that Mara knows well and still encourages people in if he thinks it'll keep them under his control. The sixth path is the path to Brahma. This is the path of Samatha Jhana. This is the path that uh, Godika was, was practicing. He was practicing meditation to gain Cheto Vimutti, which is liberation of mind, means the mind is free from all greed, anger, and delusion, but it's only the mind states that are arising. These mind states are free from all of that. Uh, the, there is still the, poten the potential for those states is still not eradicated. So as a result of practicing this, one is born in the Brahma realms for a long, long time. A lot of people, many meditators are convinced, are tricked into practicing this path, uh, and as a result are reborn as Brahmas and live there a long, long time. But it's still, I'm not sure if it is a path that Mara is, is able to find. He seemed to think from this story that uh, it, was, it was outside of his path. I think Mara is an angel. And as a result, he, when he sees people go to the Brahma realms, he, they disappear. He can't find them. So he thinks they're gone. But actually they're just in a higher realm, the God realm. So even Mara can't find them. I'm not sure about this, but if I remember correctly, it's, they're, they're outside of his, his realm. But they're not actually. They're still going to come back. And when, this Mara, when Mara passes away, or some Mara is going to see these Brahmas come down. They're going to come back and eventually they'll be back in the lower realms, the angel realms, or the human realms, or so on. So they're still not free, still not free from Mara. But the seventh path is the path that the Buddha is talking about in this verse, Sampanna Silanang, someone who has, uh, who has, uh, who is endowed with morality, or endowed with virtue. This doesn't just mean keeping the precepts, this means someone who is, has a mind that is well uh, trained, a mind that doesn't incline towards evil deeds or even evil thoughts, evil speech. A mind that is well controlled and well, uh, well subdued, uh, well guarded. A uh, mind that stays with the present moment, stays with reality, stays with uh, the here and the now. This is a re the endowed with true virtue and conduct, so the mind that is the mind that is here and now. Appamada viharinang is the one who dwells vihari in appamada, which is free from negligence or drunkenness, intoxication. The mind that is pure, totally clear, conscious, sober, alert, mindful. This is the mind that is mindful, the mind that is aware of things as they are, seeing as seeing, hearing as hearing, and sees things as, on a one-to-one -one, uh, level. It is what it is, and it's nothing else, not projecting or judging or identifying or attaching to anything, any aspect of experience. Sammadanya vimuttanam, someone who is liberated through wisdom, 
Okay. Liberated through wisdom is different from liberation through this mind state of, uh, of the jhanas, this mind state that fixes the mind. But liberation through wisdom is through knowing better, through getting on, getting the mind on a different track so that the mind has no potential for the future arising of bad thoughts or deeds or, or speech. The mind that is clearly aware uh, that whatever arises ceases, that nothing in this world is permanent, satisfying or controllable. The mind that has no attachment or no reason to attach, no inclination to attach or to desire or to strive after anything. The mind that sees no benefit in clinging or in um, chasing after anything or running away from anything or controlling anything. The mind that sees things as they are and therefore doesn't get confused or misunderstand or do things or say things or think things that lead one to suffer, that lead one to be disappointed, that lead one to be dissatisfied. Such a person doesn't go anywhere. The mind doesn't go anywhere. There's no, Nibbana is not a place, it's not a it's not a destination, it's the seventh path that doesn't lead anywhere. <laughs> there you go, there's a good description of Nibbana. It's not that it's a nowhere or a nothing, it's, it's uh, the non-going. Nibbana means the mind doesn't go anymore. It doesn't go out to the eye or to the ear or to the nose or to the tongue or to the body or even to thoughts and, and objects of... Um, of uh, mental cognition. Such a person, uh, such a person, is free from all suffering, and is uh, outside of the realm of Mara. Mara cannot find such a such a mind. So, that is the mm, meaning of this verse, and that's the most. That's the lesson that we take away from this. Um, the idea of all these other paths as being in, within the realm of Mara and our duty, our job as being to uh, rise above these, to free ourselves from these traces that we leave behind that allow Mara to track us, all of the karma, all of the things that we cling to that keep us tied to samsara, tied to uh, the world, tied to the universe, tied to suffering. So uh, another good verse and um, one that we can take a real lesson away from and use to help us and support us in our mental cultivation and our cultivation of the Buddha's teaching and the path to Nibbana. So thank you all for tuning in. I hope this has been useful and uh, I'll try to make more videos now, try to keep this series going. So wishing you all to progress on the path and find true peace, happiness and freedom from suffering. Thank you. Have a good day.